if you haven't guessed by now, it is really snowing out here. And check out these gloves my wife got me for shooting in the snow. They flip over and flip back so I don't freeze my fingers off. Best snow shovel in the world. Okay, it was really cold out there. It was down in the low 20s shoveling that snow. This is the Caffeinated Bible. The goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and other graduate level institutions for the past 20 plus years and bring it to YouTube. Right now, we're going through a series on narratives, looking at the various aspects and how to interpret narratives. This is my second video in the series on narratives and how to interpret them. So if you missed last week's, Pause this video, go back and watch that one first, and then come back and look at this one. Drop into our study on the narratives, and in particular this week, we're looking at characters within the narratives. Characters or actors within a story are really the element that drives a story forward. This is often where your opposition, conflict, resolution takes place, is in the interaction between different characters. And also, characters portray people. Or in a lot of instances, we'll have something, let's say an animal, that is then personified as a person. Because they're people, we're able to sympathize, empathize with them, disagree, enter into a sort of a mental argument with them. They really let us enter into the story in a very, very dynamic way. And there's been a lot of really interesting research that hopefully I'll be able to get to in further videos around this whole area of how we enter into and understand characters within a story. Now, one of the things I want you to realize is that you're already experts in understanding characters. What I want to do today in this video is bring a lot of that to the forefront so that as you read and interpret and study a biblical passage, you can do so a little bit more thoughtfully. Now, on this channel, I've been trying to develop a little bit of a persona or a character for myself. So, for example, the caffeinated Bible, having coffee here. I've got a reference to my bicycling back there. I've got some of my books and artwork on the wall behind me. And all of these things I hope contribute to your understanding me, as my wife would say, as a real character. Now this is one of the areas where it gets a little tricky because the way we develop characters now, primarily through, for example, film, television, or theater, we tend to develop characters visually. They don't do that so much in the Bible. In fact, think back about how many characters that you know anything at all about what they looked like. Jesus, Paul, we get some hints that he may have been short. David was short and had kind of a reddish complexion. Sarah was beautiful, but that's about it. We really don't get a lot of physical descriptions of the character. In fact, the one character who has developed the most in the entire Bible is that of Goliath. What the biblical authors are more interested in are the inner thoughts, actions, beliefs, and motives of the characters. Now, if one of the main points is to learn something from the characters within the biblical text, this raises another problem for us because oftentimes we're really not told if that character's actions, thoughts, beliefs are correct or not. For example, with Abraham, when Sarah brings her slave and tells Abraham to sleep with her to have a child, and he does, and then he sends that child away later on, you really don't get anything immediately within those stories telling you whether that was right or wrong. You have to continue reading further or in other texts to understand the moral implications of that action. So oftentimes we are left to infer and think about what that character is teaching us rather than the text coming out directly and saying, this was good or that was bad. When they do say that though, Pay attention, it's important. Another facet of biblical stories that's very interesting is that all of the characters, save one, are flawed. Take, for example, King David, the man after God's own heart. He takes and rapes one of his officer's wives and then has her husband murdered. How can this happen? Here is a hero within the text, and we see that he has some of the most despicable actions that we can think of in any character in any novel anywhere. This raises one of the central points 
of all the stories and almost every interaction with the character in the Bible. It doesn't portray the biblical characters as people for us to emulate or follow. Rather, it shows us all their weaknesses and flaws. It's what they learn about God through their failings and flaws that's often the key point here. This then teaches us to look at the lessons that they learn in regard to God. Or another way we could say it, it's not about them per se, it's through God's unrelenting and eternally faithful love, his kessed love for them, that we see them being redeemed, lifted up, and God using them in these stories. To illustrate these ideas about characters and how they function within a narrative, I want to look at Mark chapter 2, the first 12 verses. Now normally this story is read during the seventh Sunday of Epiphany, during the second year of the liturgical cycle. However, this year there's only six Sundays, and so this poor story gets left out. So to make it up, because I feel bad about that, I'm going to cover it in this week's video. Let's jump into this sequence that Murray Krieger talks about, window, mirror, window, and read the text or enter into the window or the first aspect of understanding the narrative. Mark chapter 2, the first 12 verses. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version today. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned him within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The other thing I want to say about a narrative and when you read it is that we have background, foreground, and front ground characters. Think of a stage. Background are those that are at the very back of the stage and they're really kind of there to move in or fill out the scene of the stage. Then we have foreground characters. They're a little bit further forward and they play a little bit more important role, but they're not the central characters. We interact with them and we know something about them, but they might be there. Oftentimes in the Gospels, Jesus' disciples play a role in sort of this foreground. They're there, but Jesus might be interacting with a woman or a paralytic or something like that. They're there, but they're not the very front. Then we have the front grounded. These are the people that are on the very front of the stage up front saying something to the audience. These are the characters that we want to pay attention to. In our contemporary situation today, when you watch a movie, a TV show, or let's say you go to the theater, the way they differentiate characters in the back, fore, and the front ground is often through the dress or what they wear. A classic example of this is the movie Schindler's List, which was shot in black and white. All except for one little character, this three-year-old girl who Schindler sees in the Krakow ghetto wearing a red dress. She is front-grounded. She is brought to the very front and she holds our attention. She doesn't say anything or do anything, but she holds our attention because she serves a central role within that story. In the biblical account, the way they foreground characters is by what they say, what they do. They are active characters that are really at the front of the stage. Now with those characters, the ones on the front often will be what we call round characters. We get to know a lot about them. They speak, they say, we learn about their beliefs, 
and oftentimes they might change as the story unfolds. Then we have flat characters. These are characters who really don't change. We don't learn a great deal about them. They are like characters in the background. They are there to fill out the stage. Now, when we look at this story in Mark chapter two, the healing of the paralytic, who are the round characters in the story? Take a moment, look over the story and see who you would classify as a round character in that story. So who are the round characters in the story? Jesus is definitely a round character in the story. You can see this through the amount of dialogue he has and his actions. He is definitely front grounded on the front of the stage there. But who else are some of the other characters in this story? Well, we have the man's friend who carries him up on the roof. These characters, we see them doing actions, we see them digging through the roof, and we see them lowering down, and then we know that Jesus saw their faith and then interacts with this man. So the friends there, we would kind of say, are sort of foregrounded, but we don't learn a lot much more beyond this of them. So I would kind of put them as flat characters. They move the story along, but they're not all, all the way in the background. They're sort of in this middle foreground area. What about the paralytic man? Well, we don't know very much about him at all. We don't know what he believes, what he thinks. He could have been saying the whole time, no, 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 I, feel, I really feel quite well. I think I'll go for a walk now. We don't know if he has faith or not. All we know is that when Jesus looks at him and says, rise up, take your pound and walk, he does that. He gets up, grabs his bed, and walks out of the room. That's it. He could be a bicycle with a flat tire, and his friends brought him to the divine master mechanic of the bike shop to get that tire repaired. He really doesn't do much more besides that. So I would put him as a flat character that is used to move the story along. Then we have the scribes who are sitting there. The scribes, we know what they are thinking in their hearts, and then Jesus knows what they are reasoning in their hearts and interacts with them. It's almost if it, as if they have a conversation between the two of them, but it's not verbally given. We are sort of given inside knowledge about what they think, what they're re reasoning, and what they're believing. So these people definitely move to the front of stage. Now, when we run across people that are referred to as the scribes or the disciples or the crowd, what we're getting here is a group of people who are now being portrayed as sort of like one character on that stage. Groups of people can either be flat or they can be round, just like an individual can. So we need to pay attention. In this particular story, this group of people, the scribes, are definitely round characters. We know a lot about what they think, believe, and reason, and they're playing a central role within the story. The other thing we need to watch for is what we would call stock characters or stereotypical characters. Oftentimes within the Bible, you will meet a character and they are just identified by a simple phrase describing who they are. For example, in this case, scribes. We're just giving a stock description that they are scribes. Now this is where it gets a little tricky about stereotypical or stock characters. During Jesus' day, scribes or Pharisees would have been seen in a very positive light. These were the leaders within the religious communities. These were the teachers. These were the people who led the synagogues. So they were often highly respected people. What happens though is interesting because we have the text written 2,000 years ago, and then as church history went along, we have anti-Semitic teachings and tendencies coming into the church at various times and places. As a result, groups like the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, tend to be seen on a very superficial level by people today as negative characters. But if you read the Gospels, a lot of times the Pharisees are good people. So what do we know about these people in Mark chapter 2? Well, in verse 6, we're told that some of the scribes are sitting there. Now Jesus is having this phenomenal ministry in Mar at the end of Mark chapter 1 and going into Mark chapter 2. There's hardly room in the house for people to come in and yet there are scribes right down there front and center with Jesus. That sort of indicates one of two things. Either they were very interested in what Jesus was teaching and saying, or they were worried about what he was teaching and saying. We're not quite sure. The second thing we know 
is that when Jesus tells this man that your sins are forgiven, they reason, why does this man speak like this? He is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now pick this up pretty carefully here. What they are saying is good, solid theology. If I came up to you and said, I forgive your sins, or all of your sins are forgiven, trust me, I have the authority to do it, I can do this, it's all taken care of, you would look at me and you'd say, you're nuts. Here we see the scribes giving word to what we should be asking about in this story as well. When we read Jesus telling that man, your sins are forgiven, something should immediately perk up in our ears. A, from the point of the story of the narrative, the man's problem is not his sins. The problem is that he's paralyzed. The second thing is, why does Jesus flip it here? Why doesn't he just heal the guy and get on with things? So the scribes play an important role here. They raise the question that we should be asking in our hearts ourselves. And by doing so, they bring us to the very crux or the central point of this story. Who has authority to forgive sins? Okay, so we have characters in the background, the foreground, and the front ground. We also have flat and round characters. We also have static and dynamic characters. A static character is someone who comes into the story and goes out of the story unchanged. They're exactly the same. Dynamic characters, on the other hand, they show development, change, and transition as the story goes along. Now, within this particular story, if you notice at the very end here in verse 12, it says that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now, this involves those in the background, all the other people in that room, the crowd. It also involves the scribes. They're part of this all. They're in there as well. And so we can say then that in this particular story, everybody that Jesus is talking to there or, or who witnesses this story are dynamic in a certain sense. They all are amazed. They all glorify God. And we get kind of this personification of the group as one person saying, we never saw anything like this. By doing this, by having this entire group, everyone there say this, they bring us to the punchline or the application we take out of this story. We should be amazed. We should give thanks and glorify God. This is one of the things that you want to engage in as you read the biblical text. Let your imagination go. Get into the story. Experience that cabinet of mirrors where everything's reflecting and reflecting upon each other and allow yourself to engage and dwell within the story. What does all of this teach us about characters or about how we should read this narrative? So now we're going to come, we've read the story, entered in through the first window. Then when we're looking at the characters there, we've been in the cabinet of mirrors, seeing all the reflections and reflections upon each other within the story. Now we're going to come back out through the window once again, and we're going to ask the question, so what? What do we learn from this story? The first thing is, is that the characters often drive or indicate what the meaning of this story is about. In this particular story, notice how much space is given to the scribes and to Jesus and sort of this dialogue within their minds taking place within the story there. It's not really about the paralytic man. It's about who has authority to forgive sins. Jesus and the scribes are the two main characters within this story. The scribes give word to good, solid theology. This guy is blaspheming if he's just an average man because the reason for that is only God can forgive sins. Jesus then responds to them and he says, what's easier to do? For me to say your sins are forgiven or to say, rise up and take your pallet to walk. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, I say to the man, take up your pallet and go. We see through the two main characters, the two round characters on the front of the stage here, the scribes and Jesus, what this story is all about. It's not about the healing. It's about who Jesus is and the authority that he has. And then finally, we have everyone else in the room there, except for Jesus, at the very end in verse 12. They are amazed. They're glorifying God. And they say, we have never seen anything like this. Their words give us sort of the point of application for this story. We should be amazed. 
We should glorify God and we need to understand who Jesus is, that he's the son of God and he can just as easily forgive someone of their sins as he can say, get up and walk. Once again, this raises profound questions for us. Have you ever seen anything like this that takes place? Are you amazed? How does this story or how does this window that this story gives us back on our world today transform the way you think, act, and believe? And you can leave your ideas or questions or comments down below. I'd like to leave you with another challenge is that take one of your favorite Bible stories and analyze it from a narrative perspective, just looking at the characters. Who is back, for and front grounded, who are round and flat characters, who are stock characters, who's dynamic, do they change as the story goes along, who's static. Finally, what are these characters trying to teach us? What are they saying to us about who they are and what they learned and about the nature of God? Having said all that, the little round image on my face, if you click on that, that will help you subscribe to the channel. If you click on this video link up here, it will take you to my first video on narratives. And if you click on the one down here, this will take you to a video of mine that YouTube thinks you're most interested in. We'll see how that goes. It'd be interesting to know if anybody clicks on and see where it takes them. I hope to see you next week. And until then, peace.